Hi, I'm Zoriana, and I'm here with Salim today because we have a very special guest on our show, Mr. John Ridley, filmmaker, screenwriter, novelist. He's here with us today because he adapted the novel 12 Years a Slave. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Everyone knows the story of Anne Frank. Mm. How come we don't know the story of Solomon Northup? <laughs> you know, that is a really good question. I have to be honest, I was one of those people as well who did not know the story. Not only just not reading the book, I, I look back on my education. I had a really good education. Didn't know it in any regard, had never heard the name before, but when I was presented with his memoir and read it, it is such a powerful piece of material. You have to remember, in that era, uh, people of color in the South, and we're talking uh, about 1841, certainly before the Civil War, uh, to be able to read and write was a death sentence. So for most people of color who were slaves, they never had the opportunity to tell their story. These first-person narratives were comparatively, when you consider the millions of people who were held in bondage at one point, fairly rare, but not so rare that we should not know more of these stories, have read them, have heard about them. And the thing that is particularly interesting is that Solomon Northup's story at that time when he originally published it in about 1853, it was a bestseller. Yeah. So it wasn't as if this was a minor tale that a few people knew about. It was a bestseller at the time. Uh, he had been an abolitionist after he was freed. He went around the country and talked about his story. The fact that it, it really fell out of the consciousness um, for almost 150 years is really kind of shocking. Beyond showing the atrocities of slavery, how important was education to the story? Yeah, that was one of the the things that was very interesting to me about Solomon's tale. Uh, what is a little different of, from his, about his story than perhaps other slave narratives that people might be uh, accustomed to seeing or think that they're familiar with is Solomon was born a free man. He had an education. He was living in Saratoga, New York. He was a very artistic individual. But in some regards, he took his education for granted. Solomon, can I interest you in a new cravat? Pure silk by way of the French. We're in need of a fresh carry-off in my missus's travels. Nothing more. The year has passed already. Off to work at Sandy Hill again. I am. I have just the thing. Something to suit your style and yet sturdy enough for the 40-mile round trip. It's beautiful. And what price? We will take it. Children, come see what your father has just purchased for me. Oh, one moment, sir, and you'll be assisted. Mr. Parker. Certainly. We could discuss the price. And it wasn't until he was tricked into slavery, it wasn't until he was in a place where being educated could literally get him killed. If people knew he could read, if people knew he could write, they would kill him. And all of his education was not enough to save him and protect him. As I was watching this film, I couldn't help thinking of something a little bit more present day. And what I flashed upon were those three girls who were abducted by Ariel Castro and held in chains and beaten and raped for 10 years, essentially slaves. Yeah. And so to me, this film just transcends just African-American slavery, but, but incorporates personal freedom no matter what color or race or religion you are. Do you agree? Absolutely. And one of the things you have to keep in mind, believe it or not, there is more slavery going on mm -hmm. in the world today, right now, than there was at that time. And if it is not true slavery, uh, the level of living conditions for people in the world who work, who provide, who give us the things that we want, that we use, uh, if it is not true slavery, it is almost on par with that. So the concept for people to look at this on a level, I certainly want them to come out with an understanding of American history, but not just to look at it and say, well, yeah, that, that was really terrible. That happened a long time ago. We've got to be aware that these things happen now. And whether it is a horrid and bizarre case is the one that you're speaking of, or a fundamental and true case that is happening somewhere in the world right now, uh, these aren't just elements of the past. They're things that we need to be aware of, that we need to act on, because they are happening. They're happening to people everywhere in the world. You wrote for Fresh Prince of Bel-Air yeah. and Martin and the Barbershop TV series, all this really light and funny stuff. How do you go from something like that to something so deep and heavy like 12 Years a Slave? Going from uh, comedy writing, absolutely, there is, there is a difference here. 12 Years a Slave is by no means a comedy. But the things that I learned in writing, uh, even in stand-up comedy, in telling a narrative, in shaping a story, in uh, having an arc to the stories, in some ways even directing. I certainly did not direct 12 Years a Slave. But when you read it on the page, and is there a sense of lyricism to the words and the way things are spun out, uh, believe it or not, all of that writing, all of those things, it really is kind of honing your craft. 
This film is so far reaching and it's so lived in. What kind of research did you do to be able to do the story? There were a couple of levels of research. One, just starting with the memoir and going through that page by page by page and lifting things out. Uh, elements of the language, uh, how Solomon spoke, how the people around him spoke. From there, the, the departure for me was trying to learn that language mm -hmm. so I could replicate it. Read a lot of newspapers of the era. To me, I thought that was the best source because yeah. uh, if you read other literature, sometimes that would be too elevated. Uh, plays were certainly too theatrical. But newspapers were a way of taking the language that was slightly elevated but writing for the people, writing almost for everyone because so many people had to read newspapers. But I thought the language at times, to, for me, felt almost Shakespearean. Yeah. There, it was very flowery. Yeah. And was the book like that as well? Did Absolutely. they really mm -hmm. speak that way? Yeah, this is antebellum English. It is English, but it was not my English. And the way Solomon spoke and the way that Eliza, who was educated, uh, and John, some of the educated people of color that you meet in the early part of Solomon's journey, it was very important for me to try to stay true to their language because I don't think for the most part people would look at people of color in that era and expect them to talk in that manner. Not everybody could sound the same. They all couldn't sound elevated. They all couldn't sound bass. Uh, it was really a symphony of voices. Now your next project, you've also you also directed it, and it's the, it's the first time you've directed something since 1997. So yeah. tell us a little bit about this film and why it's over a decade uh, to get back behind the camera. Directing a film is not easy, and, and everybody goes into projects hoping that they're going to work out. And for me, in that regard, you know, as part of growing up, you got to take responsibility for everything that happens on the set. And also understanding it, there's a difference between just making a film and making a film that you really want to make. And with this second film, All Is By My Side, that is about Jimi Hendrix, but a very particular take on his life and his artistry and who he was as a person, I felt passionate enough about it, and I felt like I understood what needed to be done, not just from a storytelling point of view, but from all of it, the look, the feel, the other individuals that I wanted to work with, the cast that I wanted to get together. It was all important enough for me that I felt like for it to be done in a particular way, I had to be the person to do it. And to do that, I had to have an innate complete understanding of what I wanted to accomplish and partner up with people who could execute on that level. And I was fortunate enough to be around people who their additive value, you can't even, it's immeasurable. And when you see the film and you see in every department what people brought to it, that's why this film works. It's a team. And I was lucky enough in the second time around to have a team that was on the same page with me. Now, you and I know each other because mm. we worked together on a movie review show. It was yes. called The Movie Club with John Ridley. They all know. They yeah. seen it. It was a huge hit. <laughs> and it was on AMC for two seasons, mm. and John, you were the host. But having sat in that chair where you're, you're sort of in control of a, of a critic-based show, yeah. does that put you in a particular seat of knowledge today as you're churning out movies in terms of how to handle the criticism when critics come out and may not respond in a way that you like? Or do you find yourself working on a project where you're already thinking how critics might respond to it even before the project is complete? The first time you do something, the criticism really matters because you, you either learn to accept it and take it or you never do the second thing. Criticism is an art and we live in an era where, where folks can pretty much do anything. They can comment on things, they can uh, lift things up or they can tear them down. But to really have an analysis of why you may th think things work or don't work, to be able to compare them to things that historically may have worked or not have worked, to be able to articulate it in a very deep and thoughtful way. Those are things that are not learned you know, instantly or acquired simply because you have a blog site. There is a real appreciation that I believe I have for people who can get together and really talk about film because th to be able to talk about film is an art form in and of itself and it is something that I appreciate because you know what, for other films I do look at criticism. Sometimes not before a film comes out, if it's something I think I'm really going to love, sometimes I wait till afterwards, but there's a real treat in the after effect of looking at what other people said and trying to line up my own thoughts or think why did they come to that. It's a value added to the industry, and I think it is very important. I don't think as an artist you can just dismiss it, but I do think that um, the truth is everybody can be a critic. Not everybody really is a critic because they don't have the capacity.
Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to us. We really appreciate it. As always, thank you. Congratulations. Great to see you again. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Cheers. 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 To you all and to Solomon. Indeed. To Solomon.